Hello everyone, my name is Dave Morgan. I'm from the Department of Physiology and today we're going to talk about the events of the cardiac cycle. Uh, as you've learned up to this point in the course so far, there are a number of very interesting electrical events that occur in the heart when an action potential is generated in the pacemaker cells in the atria and then that action potential makes its way across the atria and down into the ventricles and causes uh, the contraction of those two chambers. So today we're going to move beyond the uh, electrical events of the cardiac cycle and start talking about mechanical events and the actual flow of blood and the events by which a heart takes in blood from the veins and then ejects that blood into the arteries. So the lecture today is divided into three parts. Um, first we're going to start out with a simple uh, overview of some of the basic physical principles you need to understand to appreciate the events of the cardiac cycle and for that matter the rest of the cardiovascular system. And then in the second part, we'll talk about the actual events of the cardiac cycle. We'll, we'll go through those one step at a time. And then in the third section, we'll bring it together again and talk about how those events of the cardiac cycle relate to some of the physical principles that I told you about in the first section. So we can start with part one, uh, in which I'm going to basically go over three major basic physical principles that you really need to understand to understand how the heart works and for that matter, how the entire cardiovascular system works. We're going to talk about basic principles of pressure, flow, and resistance in blood vessels and the heart. We're going to talk about the elastic properties of the heart and blood vessels. And then we're going to talk about how muscle tension and wall stress influence uh, pressure in blood vessels and the heart. And then once you've understood all these three uh, different subsections, we can then go in the next section to the actual events of the cardiac cycle. So let's start with the simplest concept, which is understanding pressure, flow, and resistance in blood vessels and in the heart. I think many of you already know that uh, pressure is simply a force exerted on a surface. And so in metric units, that means uh, the units are typically newtons per square meter or pascals. Of course, in medicine, uh, it being a fairly conservative branch of, of science, they use a fairly old-fashioned term called millimeters of mercury for units of pressure. And a millimeter of mercury pressure simply means the, the amount of pressure that a column of mercury one millimeter high exerts on the surface below it. Okay, so pressure is force exerted on a surface. Flow is another very important uh, term that we need to understand. It's very simple. It simply means the volume of fluid transported per unit time in, for example, liters per minute. And we represent flow as a Q with a dot over it in some of the equations that you'll see uh, in this lecture. And then finally, resistance is a more general term for all the frictional forces that oppose flow in blood vessels or the heart or in any other sort of uh, plumbing system. And we typically represent that as resistance. And as we'll see in this lecture, but mo mainly in later lectures, resistance is determined by things like the diameter of a blood vessel or the size of a heart valve through which the blood is flowing. Okay, so in the next slide, we bring all these three things together and show you how they're related into this one very important equation, a relationship. Um, the bottom line is that in any plumbing system or in any part of the cardiovascular system, a pressure gradient is what drives blood flow. Okay? And so if you have a higher pressure in one place and a lower pressure in another place at the end of that, of that blood vessel, there will be flow between those, between those two places down the pressure gradient. That pressure gradient is typically called the delta P or the driving pressure. And you can see in this equation uh, that I've, I've outlined in red here that um, the flow rate through any blood vessel or any heart valve or anything else is going to be determined by the pressure gradient, the delta P, divided by the resistance through that tube or through that heart valve. And so anything that changes the pressure gradient or changes the resistance in a heart, uh, heart valve or in a blood vessel will change the flow rate, okay? And so throughout the, the lecture today, and for that matter, every lecture in the cardiovascular physiology section of this course, we're gonna be using this exact equation to show you that whenever there's any kind of a flow going through anything in the cardiovascular system, it almost certainly depends on a pressure gradient of some sort um, between two points in that system. So this is a crucial equation that's gonna come up a lot throughout this lecture and many other lectures as well. And understanding this simple relationship is absolutely crucial for understanding cardiovascular physiology. Okay, the second simple principle we want to get to uh, relates to the fact that um, all blood vessels and heart, uh, and the heart for that matter, are elastic vessels, which means that their walls contain all these very interesting proteins that are elastic, which means that when you stretch them, 
those stretchable elements uh, attempt to regain their original shape and so they push back when you stretch them, just like an elastic band or a balloon for that matter. And so these elastic elements in the walls of blood vessels and the heart really have a big impact on the pressure and the generation of pressure inside those vessels. And in fact, it is the elastance and the elastic properties of the heart and blood vessels that generates a lot of the pressure inside those vessels. And so understanding the concepts of elastance and compliance is going to be really important for understanding how the heart works and how blood vessels work in later lectures. Okay, so what's elastance? Um, elastance is essentially a term for the stiffness or the resistance to stretch in an elastic vessel. Okay, it's a little bit of a counterintuitive term because it's not like elasticity, it's not the stretchiness of, a, of an elastic vessel or an elastic band, it's the opposite of that, it's the stiffness or the resistance to stress, stretch. And so on this plot, for example, if we take a, a rubber balloon and start adding volume to that, to that balloon um, in this direction, then we can see that as volume is added to that balloon, the pressure in that balloon increases. Because as the volume is added to that balloon, the walls of that balloon stretch and those elastic elements push back on the contents of the balloon and produce pressure inside that balloon. Okay? And in this particularly simple case of an ideal vessel, there's a nice linear relationship between the increasing volume and the increasing pressure. And that results in a line, of course, which uh, in the slope of that line is going to be the change in pressure divided by the change in volume over that same, uh, over in that line. And that slope, delta P over delta V, is equal to elastance. Okay? And so that is the definition of elastance, the change in pressure that is obtained when you add a certain change in volume, the slope of this line on this plot. Um, you can see that if different vessels have different degrees of elastance, the slope of this line will be different. And so, for example, some blood vessels, like arteries, have much higher elastance than other blood vessels, like veins. Um, and so if you increase the elastance of a vessel, you end up with this different line here with a, more, a steeper slope. And in that case, of course, what that means is that when you add a certain volume to that vessel, you get a higher increase in pressure than you do on this other, other line with the shallower slope. And so elastance, increasing elastance means you get greater changes in pressure for a given change in volume. Plus there's one additional concept in this, in this slide that I really need to point out, and that's the concept of the unstressed volume. The unstressed volume, as you can see, is the x-intercept of this plot of volume versus pressure. And what that simply means is that that's the volume that has to be added to an elastic vessel before you begin to stretch the walls of that vessel, and before those walls then exert pressure on the contents. And so any balloon, for example, if you take it out of a package, when it's empty, it has no stress in its walls. And you have to begin to add volume to that balloon before you stretch those walls and they begin to exert pressure on the contents. And so that's what the unstressed volume is. The small amount of volume that has to be added to a, an elastic vessel before you stretch its walls. This concept does not come in uh, particularly importantly in cardiac physiology, what we're going to talk about today, but we will see it come back when we talk about veins in a later lecture later in, the, in this course. But it is worth remembering that all elastic vessels have an unstressed volume that has to be achieved before you stretch their walls. Okay, now that plot that I just showed you was a so-called ideal vessel in which uh, the volume and pressure are perfectly related to each other along a line. Uh, in reality, however, no blood vessel and no balloon, for that matter, can be stretched forever. And so, as a result, in a blood vessel, in the heart, or in a balloon, or an elastic band, or anything else, once you add enough volume, you start to see a striking increase in the steepness of that slope of that line. In other words, the elastance is increasing, the stiffness of that vessel is increasing as you add a lot more volume to it. And that makes a lot of intuitive sense. The bottom line is that um, as you stretch anything, a balloon or a blood vessel, there's only so far it can be stretched before you have reached the limit to which that vessel can be stretched. All the proteins in the, in the walls of that vessel are stretched to their maximum, and so they can't be stretched any further. And so eventually, this is going to become essentially a, a vertical line, and eventually the walls of that vessel will break, and the pressure will then plummet to zero, of course. And so, um, no blood vessel can, can be stretched forever, but the, the good news is that most blood vessels operate in this lower range here where 
volume and pressure are roughly linearly related to one another. And rarely does any blood vessel or the heart for that matter ever come to the point where it's stretching itself to the point where it will, it will break. Okay, finally, one more little term, and that's compliance. Compliance uh, is a very intuitively obvious term. Compliance means the stretchability of, a, of an elastic band or an elastic vessel, and it's obviously the inverse of elastance. Elastance was the stiffness or the resistance to stretch. Compliance is the opposite of that. It's the ease with which you can stretch something. And so for defining compliance, we plot the volume and pressure in the opposite way from which we, we did in the previous slide. We have pressure on the x-axis and volume on the y-axis, and the relationship between those two can result in a line as well, just as it does in the other plot, of course. And in this case, however, what we're seeing is what happens when you increase the pressure in a, in a vessel, you see an increase in volume. And that increase, that slope, the delta V over delta P in this case, the increase in volume that results from an increase in pressure, is what we call compliance. And so compliance increases when the slope of these lines increase. So a floppier vessel, a more easily stretched vessel, like a vein, for example, has a much higher compliance, which means that for any given change, a very small change in pressure can result in a very a large change in volume. And that's exactly why veins are so compliant, because there's a large volume of blood in those vessels, and, and yet their pressures are very low. And as I said earlier, we're going to get to veins in a later lecture. We're not going to talk about them in today's lecture, but um, understanding compliance is particularly important for understanding veins. Okay. That's the second concept. Now the third concept in this little subsection on basic physical principles is this one. We're going to talk about something called wall stress or wall tension. And it's all related to a law that was developed by a French scientist many years ago uh, called Laplace. And so we call this the law of Laplace. And it simply defines the relationship between the pressure and radius of an elastic vessel like a heart and the wall stress or tension that exists in the walls of that, of that uh, vessel. Okay, and so imagine we have a, an elastic sphere here. Uh, let's say it's a balloon for, for, uh, for our purposes here. In that balloon, you've added some volume to that balloon, and so you're stretching the walls of that balloon. You're stressing those walls. Um, and you've got pressure inside, and you've got a radius on that balloon. And you also have thickness, H. It turns out that the stress in the walls of that vessel, the wall stress, or SW, is, can be approximated by using this equation down here in red. In this equation, the wall stress is essentially equal to the pressure times the radius and divided by two times the thickness of that, of that vessel. Now you'll notice that the pressure here is listed as PTM, and as defined up here, pressure TM is essentially the transmural pressure, the pressure across the wall of this vessel, and it, it's equal to the pressure inside minus the pressure outside. Um, in the vast majority of blood vessels in the cardiovascular system, the pressure outside is zero, it's atmospheric, and so pressure out is zero, in which case um, the transmural pressure is equal to pressure inside that vessel. However, in the heart, the heart occasionally experiences situations in which the pressure outside is, is less than zero, during inspiration, for example. And so transmural pressure, pressure can, in the heart can be uh, more or less than the pressure inside the heart under certain conditions. But all that is a side issue. The key issue of this slide is this, is this equation here, which shows us the relationship between the stress in the wall of that elastic sphere and the pressure and the radius and the thickness of that sphere. <coughs> and that turns out to be really important, not just for understanding how the stress in the wall can actually tear apart the wall of a, of a blood vessel or, a, or the heart, but it also uh, relates to something else that's really important, and that is the, the forces that are opposing that stress, shown in these little red arrows here. Those forces are produced by things like the elastic elements in the walls of that vessel. So in a balloon, it would be the rubber elastic elements pushing back. And those, those forces push back on the wall stress pushing outward. And, so, and those two forces tend to be balanced. The, the forces pushing outward on the wall are exactly balanced by the forces pushing inward in a balloon. The interesting thing happens when you're talking about a heart because a heart is not simply an elastic vessel, it has muscle in its walls as well. And it can actually generate higher degrees of stress in the walls by contracting. And so muscle contraction is essentially a way of increasing the wall stress in an elastic sphere. And that ex that's explained to some extent on the next slide. So let's think about 
the heart as an elastic sphere and start thinking about it not just as a, as a passive elastic uh, sphere like a balloon, but as a contracting one that can generate its own force of contraction and can generate its own wall stress. Once again, in a heart, we can roughly estimate the stress or the tension in the walls of a heart using the same equation I just showed you on the last slide, where the pressure and the radius and the, and the thickness of that heart all determine the amount of stress that's in the walls of that, of that heart. But we can rearrange this equation, as shown here, to actually emphasize the point that the pressure inside the heart is determined um, by not just the thickness and the radius, but we can change the pressure inside by changing the wall stress, by changing the force of contraction. And so when you contract the heart muscle in the walls of a heart, that produces stress in the walls of that heart, and that stress pushes in on the interior of that heart and generates pressure. And the pressure it generates is determined by the amount, as shown in this red box here, the pressure that's generated during heart contraction um, is a, a function of the amount of tension that's being generated, the wall stress, times the thickness of that heart divided by its radius. Okay, And so, as a result, if you think about um, different hearts under different conditions with different radius, different pressures and so on, the pressure, the radius, the thickness, and the, con the force of contraction are all related to one another through this handy little equation right here. Um, it's not that you actually use this equation to calculate numbers, this equation is simply a nice way of illustrating the key concepts, the key relationships between all these different four, these four different factors, the pressure, the wall stress, the thickness, and the radius. This turns out to be extremely important in clinical, certain clinical applications, which I'm not going to get to in my lecture, but which you will hear about from other people. Um, for example, um, what it means is that uh, hearts that are enlarged with an increased radius, for example, in certain forms of heart disease, the heart is enlarged and therefore it has a bigger radius. And therefore this number in this equation over here is going to be larger and that means that to produce an, a given amount of pressure, you have to generate more wall stress, more tension, more muscle contraction has to occur and therefore more work has to be done and more oxygen has to be consumed. And so any heart that is enlarged to produce normal levels of pressure, it has to do more work than a heart that's a regular size, that has a normal radius. And that, that turns out to be a problem, of course, in heart disease where oxygen consumption can be, uh, can be increased because the, the heart is enlarged. Another common problem is hypertension, that you're also going to hear about in other lectures. And hypertension means higher blood pressure in the aorta outside the heart, out here. And basically what has to happen uh, to produce blood flow out of a heart with, into, uh, into arteries with high blood pressure is that that heart has to produce higher pressures to generate blood flow, a higher delta P essentially. And when you need to uh, produce higher pressures here, that means you've got to contract more, you've got to use more force, and you've got to consume more oxygen and do more work to generate the higher pressures that are required to eject the blood in a hypertensive situation. So the basic idea is that thinking about wall stress really helps you understand certain key issues in certain sorts of heart disease or cardiovascular disease. And, and you will get to this in a lot more detail in other lectures. Okay, so that is what I wanted to tell you about some basic physical principles that hopefully understanding these three different concepts will help you understand the cardiac cycle, which I'll discuss in the next little module. And then it'll also help you understand a lot of the other things that I'll be talking about in later lectures related to arteries, veins, and capillaries.